The Studi is a beauty that is different by design. Up front, you'll there's some other clips on the internet uh, with Avantis in competition. I think uh, most of those are not Studebaker power, but you could hear the supercharger. This is Studebaker through and through. It's actually prepared by uh, Mike Baker's shop down in Greenfield, Indiana. So if you get a chance to take your Avantis out on a track day, I really encourage you to do so and be sure and record the results and we'll, we'll share those next year when we do the Avanti uh, talk again. So Studebaker's Avanti, it was billed as America's most advanced automobile. Uh, product of the Raymond Lowy Studios, and we can see actually in this PR shot, there's Raymond Lowy standing right back there himself, overlooking his proud creation. But what led Studebaker to really uh, take a departure from their standard product lineup and offerings to really, really go boldly, if I can paraphrase Captain Kirk, uh, and to create uh, such a daring dynamic automobile? Because Studebaker's product line for much of the early 60s, you had the Hawk as kind of the flagship car, but we're talking about economy cars like, like Lark's. What led Studebaker to take this daring bold approach with the new fiberglass bodied high performance sports coupe? We have to go back a little ways. We're, okay, we're not going back this far, but uh, we'll skip ahead a little bit here. To 1953, Raymond Lowy standing next to another one of his uh, daring creations for Studebaker. Uh, Commander Starliner Hardtop, and we see that year Studebaker produced 193,000 automobiles and made 2.6 million in profit. So you might think, boy, that sounds pretty good, Andy. What's the problem here? Well, if we go back just a couple years to 1950, Studebaker produced uh, close to 400,000 cars and was making about 25, 28 million dollars in profit. But still, a profit's a profit. Who are we to uh, uh, think otherwise? Uh, Korean War, other factors, no doubt, led to the decline. And Studebaker had high hopes for as the 50s unfolded, because after all, they had this brand new, beautiful automobile. Uh, a V8 engine that was uh, just a couple years old and one of the highlights of the industry. And really, Studebaker had a lot of things to really be proud about at this time. 1954, everything got turned on its ear. We see production is down to 94,000 cars and trucks. And you notice the ink is now red on my slide here. And they lost $26 million. How did this happen? How did things get turned upside down? Well, it can be summed up pretty quickly why the Ford and Chevrolet sales war. Uh, Mr. Ford was sick of coming in second place to uh, the folks over at GM and Chevrolet, so they decided they were going to try and outsell them. And dealers were flooded with cars, with orders to take the cars and sell them. Otherwise, you were probably not going to be a Ford or Chevrolet dealer too much longer. And what happened? Well, guess who was left holding the bag? The independents and even Chrysler, not a small company, uh, they were off 25% going from 1953 to 1954. And suddenly the economies of the industry was changing. You saw Studebaker uh, get together with the Packard Motor Car Company, Hudson and Nash merged to form American Motors. And suddenly everything you thought you knew about the auto industry just a few years prior uh, was going to be completely different as things would shake out over the next decade. Whoops, I'm gonna go back, 1955. Studebaker rebounds some with 151,000 automobiles produced, but you see the loss figure is not getting any smaller, $29 million. 1956, Studebaker's brass decided that the Lowy look was simply not selling enough cars for them, so they decided to go with a more conventional look, basically mimicking what GM and Ford and the other rest of the big three were doing with more squared off uh, conventional designs. Uh, it didn't help. 105,000 cars, $43 million in profit. So we're talking over the span of about three years here. We're looking at close to $100 million uh, in losses for this now Studebaker Packard Corporation. 1957, 86,000 cars. Thanks to some pretty incredible cost cutting, Studebaker was able to whittle that loss down to just $11 million. But uh, I don't know about you, but uh, when I look at my checking account, the deficit you know, it's still a problem, not the amount of the deficit. We need, to, we need to really attack the deficit there. And it should be clear, Studebaker's executives weren't just sitting there going, huh, I don't know what to do. I mean, they were trying everything they could. They looked at new products. They looked at, uh, you know, many different ways. Defense contracts, even the Eisenhower administration uh, kind of helped Studebaker along with some financial support in 1956 through some government contracts as well. Well, in 1958, uh, Studebaker, like everyone else industry, in the industry, uh, came out with their four headlight version of their conventional automobiles. The loss was $13 million on a volume of 61,000 cars and trucks. 
Not a great year. The recession was hard on everyone, and Studebaker was no exception. The Lark, yay, comes out in 1959, Salvation. Studebaker sets a record for profit. 148,000 cars and trucks. Happy times again in South Bend. But we get to 1960. What do Ford, GM, and Chrysler come out with? They come out with their own compacts. Now, the volume held fairly well, 141,000, and the corporation has recorded a $700,000 profit. But this is a different Studebaker corporation than it was a few years earlier. Studebaker had amassed uh, some tax loss credits, as we saw you know, a massive amount of tax loss credits that they were trying to use up. You could apply the tax loss credits to profits of subsidiary companies. So in order to satisfy the shareholders and act in the best interests of the shareholders, which was the Studebaker Corporation's uh, board of directors, it was their legal obligation to do so, they ex explored acquiring other companies. And see, this is actually from how the corporation appeared in about 1961, 62. But Studebaker Corporation is now a corporation of several divisions, including Mercedes-Benz Distribution, Owen and Generators, Gravely Tractors, uh, Clark Floor Machines. You see Paxson products up there as well. That 700,000 in 1960 was profits generated by other divisions, not the automotive division. Studebaker was once again in red ink as far as automobiles were concerned. 1961, again, they're showing a profit, but the volume is dropping. The automobile division is really becoming an anchor on the corporation and Studebaker directors realized the Lark was just a temporary flash in the pan. They need to do something and they need to do something fast to right the ship. They went out in search of a new leader. Uh, Harold Churchill had led the company uh, for much of the late 1950s. In fact, the Lark was really uh, Churchill's brainchild. Uh, it made perfect sense at the time. Americans were looking for a solid economical car. They managed to create the Lark in record time. But when it came to, again, being head to head with the big three, Studebaker felt they needed new leadership. Sherwood Egbert was a 41 year old uh, former Marine, come from McCulloch Chainsaw Corporation. And Sherwood Egbert, and this is what I find amazing, he is only the second executive in Studebaker's long history to come from outside the firm. Everyone else either started at a lower position and worked their way up or were family. So the only other, does anyone know the other uh, person who, to lead Studebaker who was not, uh, who came in from the outside? Erskine. Erskine. I'd say we have a lovely prize for you, but I'm sorry we don't. <laughs> so Egbert comes in, and again, his charge from the board is we have to use up tax loss credits. We need to really, the automobile division needs to turn it around if it's gonna stay around. And Egbert realized that they had a good solid, they had a pretty solid product in the Lark. Uh, but the Studebaker had an image problem more than anything. In the early 1960s, Studebaker's reputation was, let's be honest, not good. And as you saw the sales figures, Egbert realized Studebaker needed an image overhaul. They needed it fast. He had boundless energy. He would go to the plant at all hours. He would go down on the line and meet the guys. He instilled a new sense of uh, discipline throughout the administration building that the company had never seen. It is said that when Harold Churchill led it, led the company, he was referred to as church by just about everyone. This was Mr. Egbert. Your desk was to be clear at the end of the day. You could have your blotter, uh, but everything else had to be clear. Your phone was supposed to be put in the upper left-hand desk drawer for the end of business and then brought out at the end of the day. Uh, nothing was off limits. He would poke around in trash piles. He did a whirlwind coast-to-coast -to -coast tour. And actually, uh, Sherwood Egbert, actually, he does not get credit for this. He actually instigated the idea of undercover boss when he would go into Studebaker dealers and he wouldn't tell them who he was. And he was a big guy, he's probably about my size, uh, about 6'3". And he would go into Studebaker dealers and it's like, well, I'm thinking about a lark, but I'm, I'm not sure I'd be able to get in out of it. I'm a pretty big guy. And he said it took him until the fourth visit before he found someone who showed him how easy it was and how roomy the lark was. So he realized that there was help needed at the dealer level, there was help needed at the, nat at the, at the factory and production and product level as well. So Egbert came in in February of 1961 and immediately instigated an overhaul of the Lark and Hawk lines. He retained Milwaukee, Wisconsin designer Brooks Stevens to restyle the uh, Hawk into the Gran Turismo Hawk, as we see here. Uh, but Studebaker also didn't have any money. His total budget for, to restyle both the Lark and Hawk line was ridiculously small. I think they said it was uh, just under a million dollars or someone said about enough to tool uh, 
upon a door handle. But what they were able to do, and again, we're talking about cars, the Hawks underpinnings date back to the 53 Starliner we saw at the outset. The Larks dated back to the 53 uh, sedan models. So Studebaker was really trying to make the most with the least. And uh, as any Studebaker owner knows, it's amazing what the company could do. I've always said Studebaker made the most with the least amount of resources uh, of anyone in the industry. And certainly these two products are testament to that. Well, he managed to freshen the Lark and the Hawk, but he said a new product was needed. He rang up Raymond Lowy and said, we need, we need something new. We want a sports car. We want a sports coupe. We need something to stimulate excitement in Studebaker. So let's think about this. Over Studebaker's history, from we look at the mid '30s, their areas of uh, their most successful eras were when they had bold original design from Raymond Lowy, backed with a, a comprehensive support of the factory, massive PR campaigns, 47 models right after World War II, unlike anything else anyone in the industry was building. The 50 models with the bullet nose, their best seller ever, uh, and. They stuck a propeller on the front of the car, and who knew that this would be tremendously successful, but it was. The 53 Starliner, uh, the car was critically acclaimed uh, in all circles. It was in the Museum of Modern Art as an example of rolling sculpture. But you know, I don't know if Egbert was aware of this uh, consciously or just realizing that maybe, you know, this guy was responsible for our greatest successes. Let's, let's, go, back, let's go back to Raymond Lowy and see what he can do. So they approached Lowy and he says, well, I need we need a new product, we need a new automobile, a sports car, and we want to have it by the spring of 1962. This was in the spring of 1961. This is unheard of. In the industry, three to five years is considered the normal timetable, and that's considered rushed. The Ford Mustang was considered an accelerated product, and that was just over three years from drawing board to production, and I would stress that Ford put about 60 million into the Mustang. Uh, Studebaker didn't have 60 million to put into anything. So Lowy gathered his team, uh, Tom Kellogg, fresh out of uh, design school, uh, John Epstein and Bob Andrews. Andrews was a clay modeler uh, of note. He'd done lots of work for Hudson. And uh, John Epstein, I always refer to him as, uh, as Lowy's kind of number one. He was kind of his on-site lieutenant, uh, really keeping the product on task. And you see the renderings already on the walls here. But these were not in South Bend. He took the group out to a Palm Springs bungalow uh, the reason being that he's like, well, we can do this, but I can't do it at South Bend where everyone's going to come down and see how we're doing. A vice president's wife comes through and says, oh, I don't like that. This has to be done in complete, uh, completely separate of the Studebaker design offices. About six weeks later, they've completed a couple of clay, uh, clay models. This is one of the early clay models. And we see Kellogg, uh, Andrews, Lowy, and John Epstein here. Uh, I don't know who the dog is. Did anyone know what Raymond Lowy's dog's name was? We get asked this so often. I know Maria was asking me that we get that on social media a lot. If anyone knows that, please catch Maria and myself after the, after the program. They went through a couple revisions on the clays, and ultimately an A-scale clay model was shipped to South Bend. Studebaker designers were now left to interpret this A-scale clay into a full-size production automobile. We see the full-size clay being worked on uh, behind the A-scale clay. And sure enough, Studebaker was able to meet Egbert's deadline. By April of 1962, Avantis are being prepared for production. Uh, the bodywork was made from fiberglass. Fiberglass was much cheaper uh, to tool, and especially for the numbers they were looking at for the Avanti, really made financial sense. Uh, I believe the total tooling bill to mold this fiberglass products was about $600,000 to tool up all the pieces necessary for the Avanti. Had it been in steel, you're looking at 10 to 20 times as much to make that happen. The Avanti debuted uh, late April 1962. It really made its first public splash at the 1962 Indianapolis 500. We see it here uh, on race day, as tradition would have it, the uh, pace car. And the Avanti was the honorary pace car that year. Uh, the actual pace car was the uh, Lark Daytona convertible uh, for an excellent, uh, and there's been many uh, discussions over the years about, well, the Avanti wasn't ready. No, the Lark was always intended to be the pace car. The Avanti, uh, as the honorary pace car, was an additional PR thing, really, no doubt, to help Studebaker. If you want to know more about that, I'd point out Bob Palma's with us today and has done extensive research on this topic and would certainly be happy to answer any questions you have after the program. Come on. 
So the press uh, jumped on their chance to test the Avanti. We see Motor Trend here had a pair of Avantis uh, out for testing. Uh, Road and Track did as well. Another advantage, with the mid-year introduction, Studebaker really had the media to themselves. Traditional new car introduction is in the fall, but by introducing it in May, coincidentally, that's also what they did in 1947, Studebaker really had you know, the whole focus of the automotive world on top of it. And I always love this quote from uh, Road and Track here. It's only a lark in a gilded cage to some, while to others it's the newest, freshest design to come from the U.S. builder since the supercharged Cord 812. The Avanti was essentially uh, on a modified Lark chassis with some tweaks and things to make it more amenable to high performance driving. And indeed, uh, there's many similarities between the 1936 and 37 Cords and to the Studebaker Avanti. In fact, there's some eerie similarities too. It's almost like uh, one of those things they talk about the similarities between Lincoln and Kennedy's assassination. But uh, the Lark, or I'm sorry, the Avanti and the Cord were both powered by 289 cubic inch engines. They were both had a very limited production run. And their production numbers are also very similar. There was a supercharged option for the Cord. There's a supercharged option for the Avanti. We could go on, but that's another program. So let's say you're wandering down the street. You want to walk into your Studebaker dealer. Let's say you're at George over here. You're walking down the uh, street of your hometown, walking your Studebaker dealer. You want to look at an Avanti. Well, what kind of car could you get with the Avanti? As we mentioned, it was a fairly uh, much more luxurious high-performance automobile than anything Studebaker had offered before. You had your choice of colors here, Avanti white, turquoise, gold, red, and oh, Avanti gray. We'll come back to Avanti gray in just a moment. Lots of standard equipment, option list, pretty standard for the day, air conditioning. Uh, seat belts were a compulsory option. You got them unless you specify it otherwise, but a lot of standard Studebaker items here as well. You could get a hill holder on the Avanti, a Studebaker, uh, Studebaker stable. Uh, Four-speed transmission uh, was optional. The three-speed was standard on the R1. You could also get the four-shift automatic. You had your choice of two interiors on the Avanti initially. You had the deluxe interior and the regal interior. What's the difference, you say? Well, and uh, I realize the screen gets bright as we look at the orange interior, so please avert your gaze if it becomes uncomfortable. Uh, the deluxe interior has the perforated seat cushions, while the uh, regal interior has the pleated. The door panels also, the deluxe has the smooth door panels, while the regal has the pleated. Avanti Black was initially offered, and I gotta say, uh, when you see an Avanti done in Avanti Black, it's truly a striking automobile. As anyone who has tried to paint a car black, it requires a lot of prep work to really make it look nice. And that's what Studebaker ran into. The fact that the first run of Avani's came out in black, they're like, this is taking a whole lot more prep work than what we planned on to make it look nice. So they substituted Avanti Gray for Avanti Black. Later they did bring Avanti Black back, uh, but you had to pay an extra $35 for the extra prep work it needed to make it handed. I'm sorry. Uh, $35.50. Why the 50 cents? Why didn't they just make it $36 and make another 50 cents? I don't know. It's why they did things back in the day. Some other minor tweaks as the Avanti came out early on. Uh, they changed the shock absorber mounting to coincide with the rest of the 63 Studebaker line. The early cars, and this is from Avanti number one, has the I mount on the back, while the uh, later cars had the uh, bayonet style like the 63 to 66 Studebaker model. The Avanti uh, did not have a grill. Raymond Lowy thought grills dated cars. And uh, let's be fair, he wasn't wrong because that's how most of us identify a car coming down the road. Oh, it's got this, this, and this. That's a 66 uh, Pontiac Tempest compared to the 67. So the Avanti just had a simple air intake under the, uh, under the bumper. But later they did uh, add some grill work, I think just to offer some more protection. Also gave it a little more, little more bright look from the front there. Uh, you could also get uh, the rain gutter moldings as well. That was an early ad and also became a retro kit that you could get both of those to retrofit to your early Avani's, which is why you see a lot of the earlier ones that will have both of those, but some later cars may not have. Moving on to the 1964 model year. Studebaker made a number of changes to the car for 1964. Uh, and this is where I make my broad proclamations, and I know there are exceptions, so please don't throw things at me, at least not yet. If you do, make sure it's soft. 
Your best yardstick to the casual observer looking to tell a 63 from a 64 Avanti is the square headlights. That change was made. There are a couple crossover models where there are round headlight 64s. Technically, the round headlights were still available as an option in 64, which I think was just a way that they could sell unsold 63s. <laughs> Perfectly legal at the time, I might add. And some other new additions to the option list. You see the R3, R4 engines were added, the ultra high performance engine. A uh, few other changes here as well. Where did that go on here? The transistorized ignition system. Uh, the adjustomatic steering column. And uh, if, you were if you were concerned that your clutch might, up to be, might not be up to the job, you could also get a competition type clutch for an extra $18. Be sure to beef up those left leg calf muscles before you drive one of those and stop in real traffic. A new interior came out for the Avanti. The, uh, eight, they call it the 813. That's the, uh, actually the interior designation code on your order sheet, the 813 black vinyl interior all black with the black carpets. The black carpets were actually made standard on the 64 models as well, and the uh, wood grain inserts on the interior. I always thought this looked so very rich. When you, and if you see it in person, it's certainly uh, no different. But there was a problem. Uh, when they first started putting out the, uh, the wood grain interiors, they were having trouble getting the wood grain applique to stick to all the interior surfaces. It started peeling off. So in the meantime, the engineering department authorized, I think it was about 70 some vehicles with black insets on the interior instrument panel and all black steering wheels. These show up from time to time, and every now and again people say, someone must have customized this car, and oh, well, you know, a couple hours with a spray can and, uh, and, and some masking tape, and you can probably do this as well, but no, these were actually legitimately offered by Studebakers and Interim while they figured out how to glue the, uh, the 3M Dynock uh, to all the interior pieces. Some other changes made to the 64 models. Uh, they changed the heater controls here. They went from kind of the wing style to the round, uh, one of the Studebaker designer was actually in charge of this change. He called these the soda jerk knobs. Those of you who remember malt shops and uh, know what we're talking about there. And actually said he, he was not stealing them from your local soda fountain, but apparently uh, early 50s Mercury's used a very similar control as well. And he had, done, he had worked previously at the Ford Motor Company back in the early 1950s. I thought it was very fitting and a nice, uh, nice touch on the Avani's updated uh, heater controls. The uh, door sill molding machines as well. Here we see the early model with the circles and they just went to, uh, just to a stripe pattern there. Uh, and again, he was the same designer, his name was Bob Daler. Uh, I was thinking too that that was very similar to what Mercedes-Benz used at the time. He thought, well, if it's good enough for them, it's certainly good enough for us. They also modified the uh, rear quarter window latch here. We see uh, kind of a simple latch. I believe there may have been some breakage problems with these and they had some durability issues, but they went to a much more beefy setup on the 64 cars. Again, uh, some more details. The, uh, I always thought this on the 63s, this did look a little unfinished with just the uh, spot for your hand on the door pole. It got dressed up more for 64. Uh, the ventilators also got a nice little grill work compared to the, uh, the, the window mesh screen that they put in there on the 63s. The accelerator pedal, you know, that's the one you're gonna use the most. Uh, let's make it attractive and uh, something that you wanna draw your attention to as well. Pretty sure this pedal was actually lifted exactly from the Lark model from 1963. Other little things that uh, came along, they redesigned the fascia face on the vacuum gauge and this, Last one here, they also updated the lettering on the horn button. And there's been, apparently been some debate about this. I was talking to Dave Kinney. Uh, if you don't know who Dave is, he is uh, publisher of the Haggerty Price Guide. Uh, Dave has owned approximately, I think we figured about 200 Avantis in his lifetime. I, I always say Dave is uh, much like uh, Ron Swanson of Parks and Rec who sat down and said, bring me all the bacon you have. I imagine Dave is just saying, bring me all the Avantis you have. But uh, his, he said he's had some discussion, a lot of research on this. They don't know if it's actually a conscious design change or they just revised the tooling to make the lettering a little clearer on there. Uh, hard to say either way, but it certainly is definitely clearer on the later cars, the 64s, than it is on the earlier models. The bucket seats, the, you hear about, you'll hear bonding owners talk about the thick back seats. And Basically, the 64 models, you have the little extra gusset on the back there compared to the thin back seats. 
on the 63s. And here you get a good look at the carpeting as well. The 63s had the salt and pepper uh, kind of color keyed carpeting to the interior, whereas the 64s just went with an all black carpeting no matter what interior you got. 63s, uh, you had the amber parking light lenses, and 64s, they went to the amber lens or the amber bulb inside the clear lenses. And I believe that was, there was something to do with certain states had requirements for how parking light lenses had to be configured, and this was an easy way to take care of that to meet all eventualities. Uh, an extra vent when events were added above the, uh, the hood bulge. Uh, going on the later models as well. And that was one thing, cooling, uh, interior cooling for the Avanti was a bit of a bugaboo. It, uh, the fiberglass does not insulate as well as steel cars. And that's, I remember asking my dad one time what, about driving an Avanti, he says, well, it roasts your feet. And I didn't really know what he meant by that, but I've heard others say that yes, on a hot day, uh, it can, your toes can get a little toasty from all the heat thrown back from the engine compartment. Early Avani's had the three double E battery. Uh, this battery, some GM cars in the late 50s use a similar battery. Uh, you can find them at Rural King in the forklift section. But later on, they did figure out a way uh, to adapt a conventional Group 24 battery in the later cars as well. Avanti supercharged, you got this uh, upgraded badge for 1964. And also the script on the hoods and the pirate buckles went from a gold to a chrome as we transition to the 1964 model year. So we won't go into any, I won't go into the fastener changes, although they did go from a 5 16 national coarse fastener on, I believe it was a glove box hinge to a 3 8 national fine fastener. We can go through all those in great detail later if you want. <laughs> so as a performance car, how fast was Studebaker's Avanti? I mean, I gotta say, it looked like the, the car at Sebring at the outset certainly had no problems getting up and going, keeping up with the Corvette in front of it here. But, okay, in the context of the day, what did we look at? Well, as I mentioned, no shortage of people testing the Avanti, so let's see what they had to say. Uh, motor trend with the supercharged uh, R2 engine and automatic, zero to 60 in 8.0 seconds, a quarter mile at 15.8. And you'll see these hold kind of kind of true here, the zero to 60 times, uh, road and track on 7.3 with an R2 four speed, but only 16.2 uh, in the quarter mile. They said they were having some traction problems and also the clutch, they did not spring for the extra $18 for the competition clutch apparently, <laughs> and that might have been money well spent, uh, was reluctant to release above 5,000 RPMs. The unsupercharged model, the only one I could find was a car life, uh, 17.2 to six uh, at 85 in the quarter mile. And we see a car and driver, uh, I don't know what they did to get 6.8 seconds, zero to 60, but they certainly must have known how to do it. And sports car graphic, auto sport, uh, again, pretty consistent, the high seven seconds and quarter miles in about the 16, uh, 16 second mark. So pretty impressive for the day. How does that compare to a current day car? Well, just for fun, I pulled up the specs on a 2022 Toyota Camry with a V6. We're gonna move on to the next slide. <laughs> So Avanti production, 4,634 cars were produced during Studebaker's production run. And here's where the problems come in. You're thinking, golly, you know, I've just, we've seen this wonderful story about how Studebaker produced uh, this car on such an accelerated timetable. It got great press. Uh, as we can see, they're fun to drive, you know, certainly a looker, but there were some problems. May of 1962, Studebaker produced 24 Avantis after the late April introduction. June of 62, it's not getting better. They produced 14 cars. August of 1962, we're up to 118. September, we're gearing up to 213. Okay, the numbers look better in comparison to each other, but this is not, this is not good because Studebaker was having production problems with the Avanti. We talked to Eli Spicer some years ago at the Freeman Spicer Studebaker dealership here in South Bend, and he told us a story of the first night he showed an Avanti. He said, they got one in the showroom. Uh, if you don't know where the Freeman Spicer dealership was, it's right next to Kovaleski Stadium, or in other words, about, I don't know, 500 feet from the end of the Avanti assembly line, if it, uh, maybe a little further. But you, you could literally lean out the door and see where the Avantis were being built down the street uh, at the Freeman Spicer dealer. So Eli has the Avanti on the floor. He says, it's absolutely nuts in there. There's a crowd around the car the entire night. He says, I had three guys, salesmen sitting at their desks doing nothing but talking to uh, prospective buyers and taking orders. And he said, 
At the end of the night, we had 30 orders at full list with cash deposit. So Eli could have sold all of 19, May of 62's production that night. And here's the kicker. He said, we never delivered one car. They could not get them, they could not get them out fast enough. So multiply that by you know, the 2,000 plus Studebaker dealers had, and Studebaker had a problem they had. Well, why? What was the problem? Well, molded fiberglass products uh, was contracted to supply Studebakers via Monty's fiberglass bodies. After all, molded fiberglass had been supplying uh, parts for the Corvette bodies since its inception in 1953. Seems like a logical place to go to. But the kicker was, molded fiberglass said, oh sure, we can produce the Avanti bodies and we'll ship them to you as the body in white for production. Molded fiberglass had never produced anything as complex as a complete automobile body before. They had produced the cafeteria trays, they produced the pieces for the Corvette bodies, but GM put those together. They had never put them together themselves. A gentleman who worked for molded fiberglass uh, stopped in the museum several, um, actually many years ago now, and he was telling us, he worked day to day on the Avanti project, and he says, yeah, the problem was, Fiberglass in 1962 had a shrink factor to it. He said it would shrink and you had to do a little trial and error to get it to where, you know, you had to guess on your initial mold to make it shrink to what the dimensions would be. And he said, and of that shrinkage rate, which was about 10%, he said like 80% of that occurred in the thickness. So anything that went around a corner, you really had to work it out. Mold of he says, we didn't have enough time to properly engineer the bodies for Studebaker. So we had to make our best guess. And unfortunately their best guess wasn't good enough. I'm sure many of you have heard the story of the rear window coming down to be mounted into the, into the first Avanti body, and the rear window went right through the opening and right into the car. And that's when they knew they had a problem on their hands. <laughs> it took several months uh, for MFG to get it figured out, and Studebaker eventually supplemented their line with, our mold fiberglass line with a body production plant here in South Bend. But unfortunately, uh, by that time, it was the fall of 1962, and as they say, the bloom was off the rose. Because care to guess what came out in August of 1962? Brand new Corvette. And in October of 1962, brand new Buick Riviera. So, Ed, and I know your Studebaker died in the wool, but if you went into your uh, Studebaker dealer right around mid-May, you've got a cash deposit down, you're waiting for your car, you see a brand new Corvette, you see a brand new Thunder, or a brand new Riviera, you're probably, you might start thinking about it. And unfortunately, many buyers did. Uh, didn't help either that in 64 model year, Ford, a redesigned Thunderbird came out in 1964 as well. Okay, that's depressing. I know I started off with uh, Scooter Baker losing lots of money. Now we talked about why the Avanti got stuck in production, but we're, let's go back to some fun stuff here. Can anyone tell me in 1963, what was Studebaker, what was the Avanti's most popular color? I heard white. Who said white? Show of hands. Okay, you're all wrong. Gold. <laughs> Avanti gold was the most co popular color in 1963. Can anyone tell me what the most popular color was in 1964? Gold. I heard who whispered red over here? Yes, 1964 was red. Most popular interior. This one gets a little easier. Anyone? For 1963? Or what color? I heard the fawn, yes, the elk interior. Not actually made from elk, it was colored to look like elk, just to be clear. I don't want PETA coming down on us. 1964, the black interior was the most popular. So we have, uh, it's years ago, George Krem, an SDC member, passed Studebaker Drivers Club president. He and his brother-in-law actually went through all the Avanti production orders and charted all this data, put it into a spreadsheet. So we have George to thank for all these uh, wonderful little tidbits we see here, and I like to call these the unusuals. And what the heck did I just do? There we go. There's only four buttons on here, you think. Maybe, can, Maria, can we get an old person's uh, remote for the, because uh, <laughs> Lord knows I need one. 1963, black with orange interior, the Halloween combination. They made 10 of those. Gold with red interior, they made two of those. And the only reason I put that in there, I had a Matchbox car back, and they were hand-me-downs from my brothers, but I think it was like a Chevy Impala, and I just remember that thing was gold and it had the red interior in it. And, that, and I thought that was odd then, and apparently the Avani owners agreed with me. 64, if you have an Avant, 64 Avanti maroon with elk interior, give yourself a prize, that's the only one. 
And also, if you have a gray 64 Avanti with orange interior, they only made one of those as well. Major options. Let's see what we got here. How are they built? Well, of the 14 or the 4,634 cars, just over 1,800 were built with the supercharged R2 engine. Air conditioning, which you could not get with the R2 engine, by the way, because there wasn't room under the hood. Uh, just under 1,100 cars with air conditioning. That's pretty. I mean, you figure that's almost a third of the R1s produced uh, came with came with air. Power steering. Again, a good substantial number, 3,663. And power windows, uh, 1,470. Now, if you compare this to the numbers on the rest of the Lark line, it's pretty clear that the Avanti was attracting a different type of buyer, uh, bringing new people into the showroom, which was its goal. Unfortunately, just not enough of them could go home with new Avantis. So some fun Avantis we came across here in uh, George's search. We see this one is tagged for Sherwood Egbert, one of several Avantis he had. Avanti red with black vinyl, uh, the tinted glass, power steering, a really nicely outfitted car. And this one, I saw this notation on here and it says, omit emblems on earmuffs, and that's the C pillar, and omit the emblem on the hood. So my question is, did they just not install them and left the holes there? Did they fill in the holes before the car was painted? How did this actually work here? They had, it was ordered that way, that's what the sold rush indicates there. Uh, and that car went to Evanston, Illinois. Ed, if you see a car missing its, uh, missing its earmuff emblems over there, let's uh, give me a call. We'll do some further investigation. Now, uh, we, we call this the Scotsman edition of the Avanti for the Studebaker, the same name. It's white, orange, three, no options whatsoever. Someone went in there and said, I want to buy the cheapest Avanti you can. And Studebaker was more than happy to oblige. Winston Salem, North Carolina. If you see one down there with a the three speed, it might be this car. I mean, no radio, think about this. And Avanti even had a global uh, presence as well. There were a number shipped overseas uh, to Europe. Uh, two cars were shipped to Osaka, Japan, and we see this one went to Bogota, Colombia. Avanti, it's white with black vinyl. Cars for the American ambassador to Colombia. Get special attention to body moldings, door fit, paint, etc. Couple things here. For one, this is a supercharged car. This had to be one of the fastest cars in Columbia at the time, I would think, uh, especially with the automatic and the 409 axle ratio. And it was not set up for high speed cruising, but it, boy, it could go up those mountains just fine. And let's, let's go back to this note here. Give special attention to body moldings, door fit paint, et cetera. They didn't bother to put that on Sherwood Egbert's car. <laughs> maybe, maybe it was implied. Maybe it was just assumed that. Uh, that, that uh, they would get that, that they would know. The president's car, let's take care of it. Okay, we're getting close to uh, the end of our program here. Let's go a couple of Avanti myths. And this is one, things I've heard over the years. Uh, and uh, I had someone tell me once, ask me about the Avanti assembly plant in New Jersey. And I'm like, excuse me, what? <laughs> and uh, there wasn't one, by the way. The Avanti's bucket seats are from an Alfa Romeo. Well, here we see a picture of the Avanti's interior seating layout, and we see a bucket seat there. The story is that the uh, Lowy team's instructions said a sports car seat. And, well, you can interpret that a lot of different ways. Studebaker had bucket seats in the Lark and the Hawk at that time. Well, uh, if you've ever sat in a Lark bucket seat, uh, you can put it in Avanti, provided you're no taller than five foot three. It's a very tall seat from floor uh, to the seating surface. Well, as I mentioned, uh, Bob Baylor, his name come up, came up earlier, he was working on the Avanti's interior. He had a pair of seats, I think it was from a 59 Alfa Romeo Sprint Speciale in his garage. He went home and got them, installed them in the seating buck, and that is actually the Alfa Romeo seat we see there. Studebaker engineers uh, took the seats apart piece by piece and copied them uh, almost identically for production, and yeah, that is actually true. The seats are based off an Alfa Romeo, and if you think I'm making this up, there's the Alfa Romeo seat. There's the Avanti seat. There's even uh, the seat, this inner cushion here is a separate. There's a really deep pocket down there, which if you buy a new Avanti, you can usually find a couple bucks of change in there. Uh, <laughs> but it is copied identically. That same pocket is in the Avanti seats as, as well. I also had one, I found one of these at a Studebaker swap meet. It served as a, a seat in my dorm room in college. Very comfortable. Well, 
Not really. The Avanti by itself was not going to save Studebaker. The Avanti at its best could have bought time and interest while Studebaker overhauled the rest of the product line. Uh, the Avanti, I, at their best hope, they were hoping, you know, 10, 20,000 Avantis might be able to be produced annually and that never materialized. But by itself, the Avanti was not going to save Studebaker. Uh, but, you know, you kind of wish you found it could have hit just lasted a little longer. What could have happened had Sherwood Egbert not gotten ill with cancer, had, you know, the Kennedy assassination not slowed down all of business in the United States for the better part of, you know, a month in November of 1963. There's so many what ifs in that, but we could go on all day with the what ifs. Avantis are, were, or still being made in Canada. Okay. Uh, can anyone tell me how many Avantis were made in Canada? Oh, no, you're, you're a great audience. You guys, you guys should come back once a week. Yes, Avantis were never made in Canada, or New Jersey for that matter. Uh, Avantis were made in South Bend. Uh, they were made, uh, I'm sorry, uh, over in Ohio, Youngstown, Ohio, Villa Rica, Georgia, Cancun, Mexico, and, but never in Canada. But I will finish my talk by saying the Avanti is one of, I've always said, the most improbable stories in the automobile industry. Uh, Studebaker built it for next to nothing. The car, it's remarkable. It turned out as good as it did for, you know, the short timetable, the accelerated production run. Two South Bend businessmen managed to convince a banker in South Bend, I think it was the First Source Bank, uh, to loan them money to start producing the Avani again. Can you imagine how that conversation went? You walk in there, you plop down in front of the loan officer. Well, yes, sir, what would you, what would you like the money for? Well, we're, we want to enter the automobile business. Have you ever built an automobile before? No. Okay, what automobile do you wish to build? Well, we're going to uh, buy the rights to build Studebaker's Avanti. How well did that sell? Not very well. <laughs> okay, and what do you plan to do with, you know, the questions, I'm sure, did not get easier from there, but they managed to convince the loan officer to give them the money. Avanti Motors Corporation started in 1965. The original iteration of the Avanti uh, went on to the mid 80s. It went through several reincarnations until really more recently, the last uh, Avanti branded cars were built in the late, two, you know, early 2000s. So I'll answer this qu question. Avantis are still, are, were, or still being made in Canada? No but let's not rule anything out. We still got some time here. Thank you all very much. I can take any questions. Baker is different by design.